Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm talking with uh, John Andrews. How are you doing tonight, John? I'm doing well, Dennis. Thanks for having me. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently an adult cardiothoracic anesthesia uh, fellow at Duke, uh, Duke Medical Center. Um, I also completed pediatric anesthesia fellowship, uh, anesthesiology residency, and uh, medical school all at Duke University and Duke University Medical Center. Prior to that, I was a Special Forces Medical Sergeant in both the Army and the Army National Guard, and I'm still serving as a medical a uh, core officer in the Army National Guard. Outstanding. And you're definitely the, the guy I need to talk to about this question. So a problem I've definitely, I've had issues myself and training other guys is how do I manage uh, analgesia and sedation in a patient who is already altered? And um, so I guess kind of setting up the scenario, I'm used to using a, a zero to 10 scale. Um, I've even started using the RAS scale for sedation, but when that guy is unconscious, I'm I'm a little bit out of my depth unless he's like reacting wildly to a pain stimulus, you know. Um, but anything short of that, uh, I'm I'm kind of guessing on is this a a pain thing or is this a sedation thing? Uh, so how do I do this? <laughs> So it's it's tough, um, especially out in the field. And I work in the operating room environment, which is as controlled as it can be, right? I have all the monitors, I have all the hands, I have all the medications, um, I have a, a ventilator if, if uh, things go south and I need to transition from a sedation to a general anesthetic. And when you're out in the field and, and you're, you know, you're, uh, the the field medic or the corpsman or the the uh special forces medical sergeant um you have yourself and whatever tools you brought with you um so the in the prolonged field care environment you have usually a little bit more than what you carry out into the field you know but you're still uh limited with what you have so i you know i try to keep it simple um when I'm considering the patient is under sedation, the first thing I want to do is I want to know what my capabilities and my limitations are and know when to ask for help. I think that's one of the great things about prolonged field care. If you get into a situation uh, that is beyond your expertise, that you always have the capability, at least in theory, to call, you know, hire for telemedicine support. That being said, if you have that queasy feeling in your stomach, about doing something, definitely ask for help. Maybe think twice about doing it because once you commit to putting a patient under sedation, um, you know that that is going to exhaust some of your supplies and your manpower, and really, the medic in the pro prolonged field care um, situation is going to be the one taking care of the patient. So you pretty much removed yourself from everything else at that point once that patient is under sedation. Uh, so what are, what, are, what do you have to look at? Um, so this is not general anesthesia, right? This is a sedated patient, uh, with or without an already altered level of consciousness, which could be from, you know, TBI, shock, whatever. They're not their normal cells. So we're talking about a high risk intervention. Um, so before I do anything and, and to get off track just a little bit, it means you need to do a thorough pre-procedural assessment of the patient, especially with regards of the airway when they last ate or drank. And you also need to have a contingency plan for things when things go wrong, as they often do. So we know the MS MAIDS uh, acronym, the Machine Suction Monitors Airway, IV and Drugs. Uh, I think that's been covered on the Prolonged Field Care podcast before, so I won't belabor it, but just know that acronym like the back of your hand, if you're going to go into the sedation uh, arena, because like I said, after that, there's, you know, there's no turning back, you either have to wait for the drugs. 
to uh, wear off or whatever procedure that you're doing to, um, to finish up. Uh, so what do I look at in the, in the sedated patient? So you're limited, right? The patient, because they're sedated, uh, they may not be able to tell you uh, as succinctly as what you and, you and I could, what is going on with them. So you have to look at other things, right? You have to look at your ECG and your heart rate. If they're in pain, typically uh, they're going to have a sympathetic response that is going to include an increased heart rate, uh, so tachycardia, possibly an increased respiratory rate, so tachypnea, uh, an increased blood pressure, hypertension, and then um, uh, patient activity, so some kind of response to the stimulus. Because remember, this is sedation. This is not general anesthesia. So if a patient is feeling pain, um, they are still going to have a response to the stimulus because what is sedation? It's a reduced state of consciousness where the patient is still able to respond to a verbal or physical stimulus with maintenance, with maintenance of a patent airway and adequate ventilation. So the key is they can still respond to verbal or physical stimulus. If they can't do those things, then you have entered into general anesthesia. And that's not where we want to be. Okay. So, I mean, there's, when you say activity, I'm sure you, in your own mind, know exactly what that means. Um, but there's a, definitely a difference between a, a pain stimulus where they're withdrawing and like ketamine hands where they're just kind of playing around in whatever field on whatever planet they're, they're on. Um, what is exactly is the difference? So it's, it's kind of hard to say, uh, usually, and so with what I do now, I, I am, you know, usually confined to the other side of the drapes. So I have, you know, the head of the patient, the anesthesia machine, all my medications, and the surgeon is on the other side of the drapes. And if they're telling me the patient is moving, then I can't really differentiate between um, just sort of random movements and a response to pain. All I know is that I need to make it stop so that the surgeon can do whatever they need to do. And I, I think that is, that, that's part of the conundrum is whether it's uh, agitation, which can sometimes happen with ketamine, or whether it's a response to pain. Uh, again, you kind of have to go off your vital signs. If those are unchanged, if the patient's not tachycardic, if they're not hypertensive, if they're not tachypnic, um, then I would say it's probably, uh, you know, just a, a patient that is sedated and is not paralyzed and may, you know, move here and there. Because that, that's the one thing that it's, I think it's hard for people to understand is you're not paralyzing the patient and that they could have random movement and that they could have a response to a surgical stimulus because it is sedation. So you have to ask yourself, what are the goals of care? What do I need to do to accomplish whatever procedure, you know, to successfully get through this procedure and keep the patient safe? Because if, if you absolutely, without question, need the patient to not move, then you need general anesthesia. And that's a whole other, you know, and then you're getting to, into a whole higher level of care that you need to provide. But as, as to, you know, whether I can say for certain whether this is a response to pain or if this is just the patient uh, having agitation or just random movements, usually the vital signs are going to tell you that. You know, vital signs are still vital no matter what you do. And if the, if the patient isn't tachycardic or tachypnic or hypertensive, um, then I think you can be, in most cases, pretty certain that it is not pain. Now you know, that I'm one of those people that I will never say always and never. <laughs> um, and I just said never right there, but everything has an exception. So as far as like knowing when, uh, when to say uh, something is pain or not pain, you, it's like anything. If your patient's not able to tell you, then they're going to tell you in some way, which is usually the vital signs. Okay. Um, cause I've definitely seen it. They'll move 
in some way, right? Whether it's pur purposeful because it, there was something that was painful or they're just moving because they're still able to. And, you know, the, the reaction out of the student is, okay, you know, send 300 milligrams of ketamine, you know, to make that never happen again because it freaks me out, um, which can then push them into a much deeper uh, plane than maybe they were ready for. And that leads to even more problems. You know what I mean? Um, have to take their airway. and Yeah, I think that's something that comes with experience, though, is you know um, sort of how to. It, it It's a hard thing to learn coming from, you know, a person that went through uh, a significant amount of medical training in the military and then having to learn all this in the OR. And even still now, I see things that surprise me. And um, the the great limiting factor is the patient. Every patient is different, right? So how much of a drug you give to one patient is not going to be enough for the next patient and is going to be way too little for the patient after that. And, you know, patient comorbidities, patient um, body habitus, um, body mass, uh, how much of alcohol a patient drinks, or if they're using other recreational drugs, all those things come into play. And you, a lot of times you won't know, um, what is going to happen until it's happening there right before you. Right. Um, uh, I think it just, a lot of it is just, like you said, you know, it comes with experience and it comes with having a base kind of principles. So, you know, we have the, the analgesia and sedation CPG, which I think sets things up pretty well um, as far as principles and priorities, but it always comes down to some experience and, and what is your gut feeling? You know, does it look like he's a, in pain? If uh, your gut feeling says this was pain, then you give him an analgesic. If you don't have that feeling, well, maybe he needs a sedative and uh, kind of balance things out. Right. And I think it's important to know that a lot of the medications that we give um, for sedatives, they don't have a great analgesic effect, right? So um, medications like uh, midazolam or, or Versed, uh, great for sedation, not so great for analgesia. Uh, fentanyl, you know, opioids and, and medications in, in that category, they give, you know, analgesia. The sedation isn't as great as, say, a benzodiazepine. So, and then to counter that, they both have synergistic effects when it comes to respiratory depression. Uh, so finding the perfect drug for, for sedation and an analgesia can be difficult. And I'm not sure that it exists. Right. I mean, there's, there's a reason why, you know, you have multiple tools at your disposal. Um, it's not just because you've been sponsored by all the drug manufacturers. It's because there's a variety of situations where one tool may be better than another. Um, but you have to be familiar with all of them in order to accomplish whatever goal you have. Correct. Right. And that's why I would, especially in the, the setting of prolonged field care that somebody, you know, you haven't gone to medical school and you haven't done training in uh, anesthesia, residency, fellowship. So get very good with the limited number of drugs that you have. You don't have to be an expert at every drug that's out there, but you should definitely know uh, midazolam, fentanyl, hydromorphone, ketamine. Um, I, I don't know if, if uh, if the folks have started using dexmedetomidine, uh, but you know, there's just a handful of drugs and they're reversal agents. Um, you know, Narcan for opioids, um, uh, flumazenil for, for benzodiazepine. There's a limited number of drugs that you really need to know uh, when it comes to sedation. Um, so I would just get really good at those medications. That what what are the safe doses uh, and not you know, worry about knowing every drug that's out there because even I don't know that. Right. I mean, I think the 
one the one drug that's kind of weird, I guess, at least in my mind, is ketamine. And that, at least the way it's been always been described to me, is it almost necessitates um, some kind of um, midazolam use just to put that patient in the in the correct plane or, or a better plane so that he has a positive trip and then doesn't um you know have the, the emergence reactions or the the bad trips i guess that can make things more difficult for you me uh, uh later on right 100 percent uh ketamine given uh on its own has great analgesic properties, dissociative properties, depending on what dose you use. Uh, but early on in my anesthesia training, I made the mistake of using ketamine without using something to counter its effects, something like midazolam or dexmedetomidine. And uh, the outcome is almost always the same. The patient will, uh, you know, come out of sedation or uh, general anesthesia and very uh disoriented or uh, agitated or aggressive and all that could be mitigated by giving uh you know a sedative like midazolam or dexmedetomidine but the situation always dictates right because sed or ket ketamine on its own doesn't usually cause respiratory depression that being said i've seen it given uh in a high enough dose and given fast enough that the patient can become apneic and if you add to that, you know, fentanyl, opioids, um, uh, midazolam, or, or other benzodiazepines, then, the, you know, that ketamine is going to have a, a synergistic effect, especially if you have a patient that also has sleep apnea, which is not, you know, which is not uncommon in the military population. Right. Um, that's interesting uh, that you mentioned sleep apnea specifically. Is I mean, is there anything... That's just correlated with with that well or? as far as anytime you have a patient that has a history of sleep apnea or um, uh, snoring or other criteria that would indicate to you that they have a uh, higher risk of having sleep apnea even if they haven't been tested for it you're concerned that they're going to obstruct and that their airway is going to obstruct especially in the state of sedation so if you give a medication like ketamine, usually you're not worried about that patient having um, apnea or obstruction uh, with sedation. But if you add to that any other medication um, that is going to have sedative properties, then there's, you know, there's always a higher risk that that patient's going to obstruct and have some kind of adverse respiratory event or adverse outcome. Okay. Um Another thing you mentioned is about the, the speed of administration, and I've definitely seen that um, now that I've been using uh, fentanyl a lot more frequently, um, just because it's addition into the T-Tri-C um, protocols. But when I see guys using it, uh, fent uh, fentanyl, uh, ketamine, and Versed, all of them, I think guys have gotten kind of used to just pushing it fairly rapidly versus doing a slow push and um they're they're having to <laughs> deal with the side effects of that um is that kind of a universal uh thing where the speed of administration is going to affect uh the outcome oh for sure uh so in the anesthesia world you're in often in a unique situation where uh you're in a high turnover environment right you you have multiple cases in that day, and there, there is incentive for you to move along quickly. So you don't have all the time in the world to uh, induce a patient or, or sedate a patient. Um, so you have to be quick about it, and you have, it takes a lot of time to learn the skill. Uh, but the prolonged field care environment is not that, right? You don't have pressure for turnover. Uh, you don't have incentive to uh, finish your case early. You, your incentive is to get the patient through safely, and that's all you have to worry about. So you have all the time in the world to get that patient properly anesthetized or properly sedated prior to the procedure, right? Um, and, th and that's how you should approach it. Uh, any medication given in sufficient dose 
and in a short amount of time can cause a patient to go apneic. Even, uh, uh, you know, medications like ketamine and dexmedetomidine that don't traditionally cause respiratory uh, uh, depression. So it's, it's always got to be something that you're thinking of. So if you're giving benzodiazepines and opioids rapidly, uh, then you're going to be at high risk to, to cause not only respiratory depression, but hypotension, because those, those drugs can all cause a uh, uh, decrease in systemic vascular resistance, especially if given rapidly. Uh, even ketamine can cause, there's, there's case reports of ketamine causing uh, decreased systemic vascular resistance on induction when given rapidly. So I guess to you, what is, what is rapidly? So rapid, so we're not patient uh, organisms, right? Mm -hmm. These medications all have dosing guidelines and that they're to be uh, administered over a period, you know, a period of time, and usually it's a few minutes. Now, medications like succinylcholine and rocuronium that aren't for sedation but are, are traditional anesthetic drugs must be given rapidly to achieve, uh, you know, um, uh, optimal intubating conditions. Mm -hmm. So there are certain situations where medication should be given rapidly, uh, but medications like uh, fentanyl. Um, uh, uh, midazolam, they can be given slowly over a period of a couple minutes. Because if you slam that thing in over a period of a couple seconds, the it will not have the desired effect that you wanted. Right, right. You're gonna you're gonna have those those uh, um, adverse effects that you were trying to avoid. Uh, so as far as what is the time, I think in anesthesia, everybody uh, gets fairly used to. Um, pushing drugs rapidly, especially at induction of anesthesia. But we also have the luxury of having drugs to get you out of that situation uh, very quickly. Drugs like phenylephrine, um, epinephrine, uh, you know, if something would happen uh, where the patient's uh, cardiac output would drop, their systemic vascular resistance would drop, uh, things like that. Right. And we're, we're much more adept and trained at using those medications and recognizing what's going to happen. So I would say, you know, you have all the time in the world in the prolonged field care setting. Right. Admi administer those drugs over, you know, minutes if you can and not seconds. So I think uh, people fall in the trap. They have a syringe. They want to give what's in the syringe and they give it without really thinking about it. You know, if you think, Oh, I'm going to give a hundred micrograms of fentanyl and you know, you don't have to give all hundred micrograms at once. <laughs> if, if, even if that's what dose the textbooks say, you can give, you know, 12.5 micrograms, yeah. you know, wait a couple minutes, see what happens. Give another 12.5 because you can't take that medication back once you've given it right. Once right. you <laughs> Once you've given it, you got to own it and you got to deal with whatever um, adverse consequences happen from whatever you gave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely um, when talking with other Deltas or, or whomever uh, that have received some kind of training uh, very frequently. They're like, yeah, I, I was talking to a, a CRNA or an anesthesiologist with, you know, some other soft unit and they told me just go ahead and slam this. And, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. They kind of forget the context of the person that told them that this was okay to do because, you know, just like yourself, you know, taking the patient's airway was probably the intent from the beginning, which is why you pushed it a drug fast because you wanted to induce them for surgery. So you could take their airway without having to fight them and, uh, get them ready for surgery versus he was in a lot of pain because of a bullet wound or whatever and you know slamming you know high doses of drugs rapidly or really any dose of drugs rapidly more rapidly than you should can have negative results and if you're not prepared for that result uh can lead to a bad day pretty quick right and i i think early in my training here at um uh, as an as an anesthesia trainee, as a as a resident, uh, there were certain people that would you know you would work with, 
and you would give them a syringe. <laughs> and because uh, as a, early on in your training, you don't you don't push the drugs for induction. You're still learning how to do everything, and that that is considered a learned skill, right? That that only later on in your training that you know you start to do more and more. You know these medications all have uh, consequences if given rapidly and in a sufficient dose. How does the patient's physiology affect like the dosing and the timing of a of a given medication? An analgesic first, let's say. It it's everything. Uh, I think in in many cases with prolonged field care, the patient is going to be in a state of hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, septic shock, one of those states. So often you're dealing with a decreased, you know, volume of distribution that the drugs, and, and what that means is, you know, there's essentially less volume for the drug to have to work. So a small dose of opioid or benzodiazepine can potentially have devastating consequences in these patients. So you see this when, um, a lot of times when we have trauma patients that it takes almost nothing to to induce anesthesia and get them off to sleep and the maintenance of anesthesia often uh takes nothing because they have such little physiologic reserve so uh, and it's this is you know uh part of the the clinical practice guidelines start low go slow and titrate to the desired effect um, and I think that's also why you have trauma patients as one of the um, the most at risk patient populations for having awareness of anesthesia, just because they are so um, uh, they're they're always teetering right on mm -hmm. the the verge of collapse. So they require such little anesthesia to keep them asleep, but also. Uh, they have a higher risk of awareness because you know you're just not able to give them a lot of anesthesia because physiologically the reserve just can't handle it. Uh, do you have any like basic, you know, guidelines that we could go off of, like you know, reduce your dose in a in a hemorrhagic, you know, in a shock shocky patient? Hey, just oh yeah, off the I, top of the bat, just cut it in I, half. You I, know? I think that that's an easy, and I think it it it's another one of those things that comes with experience because we have patients, uh, you know, that come in for cardiac surgery that have very little physiologic reserve and their heart function is very poor. And, uh, you know, I've seen that you can induce almost any patient with propofol if you're willing to give it a chance to work. I've seen patients induced with 20 milligrams of propofol that are very sick and, you know, um, 100 micrograms of fentanyl if you're just willing to wait and give the medications a chance to work. Okay. And then, you know, obviously they're going to require more anesthesia for maintenance. Right. Um, but just to get them off to sleep uh, safely, you know, it doesn't take much for right. patients that are sick. And, and that's just it. You just start with the lowest dose. And the thing is, as I said, you're not under pressure in most prolonged field care situations, you're not under time pressure. So you can take as long as you want, you can give as little of a dose as what you want. And you can always get more and just titrate it to effect titrate it to, you know, respiratory rate, um, blood pressure, tachycardia, patient response, you know, mm -hmm. verbal response to stimulus, and, um, and uh, if they have a motor response to stimulus, you can titrate it to those things. Right. Uh, and, and that's key that you have time. No, I mean, I think gen or majority of the time, we, we definitely have the ability and the time to, to kind of titrate to effect. Um, but there are definitely some situations, especially when you're talking, you know, before PFC, when you're talking about T tri C or, or things like that, where you are just forced to work a lot faster than you're probably prepared to, um, would you, do you have any advice as far as um, how to get control of a patient in a, in a smart and safe way who probably has not yet been resuscitated? I am, you know, maybe I need to get control of his airway because he really doesn't have one um, in, in those type of environments. 
Well, that that's when it becomes really difficult, right? Mm-hmm. Because treating that patient is very resource intensive. And that the key is, you know, to establish fire superiority and get out of that situation, right to where you can take care of the patient the way that they need to be taken care of. So the, you know, the T tri C is your, you're temporizing at that point to get them to that next higher level of care. So <laughs> And and you're also limited by whatever medications you have, right? So right. could I could I intubate a patient with just ketamine alone? Yes, I probably could, but it would take a heck of a lot of ketamine in many cases, unless that patient is already um, you know hemodynamically unstable. In which case, then maybe and and in which case maybe they're already unconscious. So the un- unconscious patient, um, you know, from trauma or shock, that patient is going to, as I mentioned earlier, require a lot less uh, sedation and anesthesia. So whatever, you know, your dose you were considering giving uh, to a healthy patient, like you said, cut it in half, maybe even cut it in and uh, give a quarter of that amount. Because the unconscious patient, remember, you just need that patient uh, sedated or are in a plane of anesthesia just enough so you can get the tube in. You got to always remember what are your goals? Like, what do I need to accomplish? I, do I need to get the breathing tube in? So what do I need to accomplish to get the breathing tube in? And also think about what will I need after I put that breathing tube in? Because then I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to be ventilating that patient, right? Mm-hmm. If the patient's not breathing on their own, you're going to have to ventilate them with either uh, one of your teammates uh, a ventilator or you yourself are going to have to, you know, hand ventilate the patient. Mm-hmm. So just, you know, I, I know that, uh, as medics, we always, we get in this mindset where I have to do this. It's really hard to see the consequences of what happens after that, you know, um, second and third order, uh, ramifications of whatever you do, because you're tying yourself up at that point, right? Because you committed to, uh, advanced airway um, intervention in this patient, whether it be uh, general endotracheal intubation or cricothyroidotomy or, um, you know, even uh, nasopharyngeal airway or oropharyngeal airway, that takes some kind of, right, you just can't tell somebody to ho- hold the mask on this person and, and ventilate them. That takes, that's resource intensive for you as the medical provider to instruct them and in what they need to do because you need to manage the patient, right? So if you're handbagging and ventilating the patient, then it it's it's more difficult to manage the patient's overall state. So no, you I absolutely agree. You know, we we're, we're trained to just go, 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 go. Um go with your gut, um, you know, basic principles and just keep going and going, going until you know things kind of declare themselves in some ways we get i agree we box ourselves into a corner where it's like uh you know hit them with big doses you know ketamine is safe you'll never kill anyone with ketamine so it really doesn't matter how much you give them uh that's kind of way the way things have been put to us and um we'll do that we'll be able to get the airway maybe if we, if that's what we wanted or we get control of the patient, but um, dealing with those consequences, right? So let's say you were in a situation where, um, for whatever reason, non-airway reason, you had to give a, like a takedown drug, takedown level of uh, an analgesic, let's say ketamine, right? And the patient now becomes apneic because of that. Where do you draw the line of, I now have to take this patient's airway, or I need to do some kind of, um, or take his airway with, you know, a tube, plastic between the cords, um, or I need to do some kind of airway maneuver, some kind of stimulation until this drug wears off and he will take care, take control of his own airway. I guess, where do you decide? Right. So it's, you know, you're going down your airway algorithm right here. So if you give a a patient such a dose of ketamine, and honestly, this is something that is that I've heard can happen because there's different 
uh, formulations of ketamine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and every institution has a different uh, formulation of ketamine. Some are like 20 milligrams per milliliter. Some come super highly concentrated. Uh, right. So ketamine is a drug that is commonly uh, misdosed and uh, patients are not uncommonly given way too much uh, ketamine than what is intended, right? Mm -hmm. So like we talked about, any drug and given in a high enough dose can cause a patient to go apneic, right? All things in moderation. You give too much of anything, you're going to have an undesired effect. So you have to go down your airway algorithm. First off, the patient is not, if, if, you're, if you're going down this route where you're going to start sedating a patient, then the patient should be monitored, right? Before you even administer any medications, they should have, you know, at a minimum, blood pressure, uh, pulse oximetry, and heart rate. And then, you know, optimally, you'll have end tidal carbon dioxide uh, uh, detection and a waveform. That's optimal if you're, you know, if you're thinking about going down the sedation route or the anesthesia route with your patient, they need to be monitored before you give anything. So if you're doing that, you're going to see, you know, what is happening. You're going to see them stop breathing. You're going to see the end tidal carbon dioxide just uh, drop off or the pulse oximetry if you haven't placed an advanced airway device yet. But the first thing you're going to do is, is what you always do. You're going to try to ventilate the patient. Uh, if they are obstructing, you're going to place an oral airway. If you cannot uh, get them to, you know, ventilate with an oral airway and uh, bag mask ventilation, then you're going to have to do something more invasive. So you're going to either have to place an LMA or you're going to have to place an endotracheal tube until they start breathing. The key is, if you can mask ventilate the patient through that, then you don't have to intubate. The problem is the, you know, the, the half-life and the, of ketamine can, can be a couple of hours, mm -hmm. especially if you give such a huge slug of it in a patient who's already sick. Um, you know, that apneic period probably isn't going to last the full couple of hours. It probably only going to last 30 minutes, but that 30 minutes, in an environment that is the prolonged field care or T tri C environment is not one where you can just, you know, easily sit there and mask a patient for a half an hour. Um, so you have to go down your airway algorithm is the best thing for you to, or most practical thing for you to do is it to intubate the patient. So these are things that you have to think about on the fly um, in the OR that we, you know, often do. Sometimes you can't mass ventilate the patient and you you think well maybe it's better that I just intubate this patient right now rather than trying to to fight this mask obstruction for ten minutes as the patient desaturates. I think the best thing to do right now is to just place the endotracheal tube so we have a definitive airway. And you need to start thinking like that once you're talking about sedation because I know we think when we think oh we're just going to sedate the patient that can uh uh rapidly decline into some somewhere that we don't want to go right if the patient's unstable or the patient has a really bad airway obstruction um, we have to be prepared all the time about what is the worst possible thing that can happen right now and what am i going to do and do i have the capabilities with me to to go there if i have to so we we always need to be thinking about that as medical providers whether it's in the hospital in the operating room or out in the field in the T tri C or the prolonged field care environment. Right. Um, you know, uh, it was just a minute ago, you mentioned, you know, ketamine having a half life of a couple hours. That's, that's probably the first time I've ever heard somebody say that uh, ketamine is, is kind of a long acting type of analgesic. Um, have you, have you experienced that where it's, most of the time it's going to, you know, when you give ketamine, the effects that you see are going to be like 30 minutes. Right. Right. But if you give a huge slug of that mm -hmm. drug, right. if you give way, way more than what you were supposed to, then the effect is going to be, uh, you know, it, it can be 30 minutes. It could be an hour. And if we're, if we're talking about a sick patient, then the effects of the drug can be longer than that. Mm. Okay. So. Everything has to be taken in the context of how sick the patient is, how much drug did I give, um, 
how quickly did I give the drug? Did I give the drug over a extended period of time, right? So in the OR, I will usually bolus ketamine uh, if I'm using it for analgesic effects uh, once an hour. And so there's, there's um, some of the anesthesia literature as far as what is more beneficial, doing a, a ketamine infusion or doing a bolus. There's really not that much of a difference, at least in the anesthesia literature. So whether you're, you know, bolusing it every hour or, or uh, giving an infusion, it's pretty much the same thing. So that's why I say when, you know, ketamine can last a couple hours, um, that's based on the context of the way that I give it in the OR. And that's usually like uh, a half a milligram per kilogram up front, and then a quarter of a milligram per kilogram um, when I'm redosing it. Okay. And usually you see the effects of it are about an hour. Okay. So when we give small doses, uh, you know, for sedation, usually we're giving smaller doses, uh, like uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, something like that, milligrams per kilogram. And the effects of that probably won't be as long. Okay. That's your maintenance type, type of infusion? Uh, when when I push. do it in the OR, I usually, yeah, I usually bolus like uh, half a milligram per kilogram up front at the beginning of surgery. And some people give one milligram per kilogram up front at the beginning of surgery and everything is, is contextual, right? right? What else did you give? What's the indication? How sick is the patient? Right. Um, all those things matter. Uh -huh. um, and if you have a really big patient, so you have a patient that's 150 kilograms, which is not unheard of, right? Uh, giving a half a milligram per kilogram or a milligram per uh, kilogram of ketamine is a pretty big dose of ketamine. Um, yeah. So everything is contextual, right? Like, uh, patients don't read the textbooks. <laughs> so, and, and these are things that come with experience. The problem is a lot of these situations people are in for the first time. So they're um, left to go with whatever the textbooks say. I would just say that in almost all cases, uh, if you have the time, you don't have to give as big a dose as, as you know, what you think you normally would. Because the textbooks, when they do those studies, they're almost always on on what? They're almost always on healthy patients, right? Mm -hmm. Or healthy subjects. A lot of times when we're taking care of these patients, they're at their worst. They're hemodynamically unstable. They're they're in um, uh, hypovolemic or hemorrhag hemorrhagic or septic shock. They're in the worst state they could possibly be in. So all of that matters when you're, you're thinking about how to dose these medications. And um, I think the, you know, with what we talked about earlier, starting at a uh, half of what the the dose is or even a quarter of the what the dose is is a good place to start right then when you're redosing you know you're doing your you're kind of a, your maintenance but um bumps you know just kind of a, an understanding or a basic idea of when do you expect this to come off and i have, end up having to redose it if you find you're redosing it a lot more frequently well maybe you need to adjust your dosing of your maintenance. And that's exactly what we do in the operating room. We, uh -huh. we see, uh, you know, the vital signs up on the screen, the patient is starting to get tachycardic. Um, in many cases, and not all that is because they're starting to have pain. And that's because whatever we're doing is not enough to counter the effects of the surgical stimulus. So that is always has always got to be in the back of your mind, like is what has changed, right? The drug has worn off or the surgical stimulus is, is more than what it was before. So you can't fix the surgical stimulus, right? But you can uh, redose your medications. And you always have to keep in mind, how much longer is this procedure going to take? Um, if I slug this patient with a ton of opioid right now, and the procedure is almost done. Yeah, it's going to get him through this this little bump in the road, but then after the surgery's over, is he going to obstruct when I try to wake him up? Right, mm -hmm. whether it's sedation or general anesthesia, that that uh, opioid is probably not going away. So you just need to think about everything that you do has a downstream effect. Right. Um, and a slightly different, I guess, question. Um, 
started talking about doing a podcast, I had mentioned this, but the use of IV lidocaine as a, um, I guess, opioid sparing type of drug. Um, I haven't seen lots of literature on it. I've, I've heard a couple podcasts about it, but um, are you... Are you seeing people use this for that yeah, reason? We, so we use quite a bit of it uh, in the uh, the acute pain environment and the perioperative environment. Um, and I think it's an effective drug. The problem with lidocaine, it has such a, a narrow therapeutic index. that, And what that means is, and it, sorry if you already know this, but a drug that has a narrow therapeutic index means that the dose required to get a response and um, between that and the toxic dose is very small. Mm -hmm. So in, in order to get a, a, a dose response from lidocaine for pain, I think you need somewhere around the, uh, it's like one point, uh, it's like 1.5 to three micrograms per milliliter um, concentration in the blood. I, and forgive me if that's wrong, I'm pretty sure that's right. So that's that's what dose you're shooting for, but the the toxic dose is is I think five micrograms per milliliter, and that's where you start having neurotoxicity. And the cardiotoxic dose is like ten micrograms per milliliter. So it'd be a really difficult medication to use in the field because uh, I think for that medication to be used safely, it really has to be on a pump. It's one of those medications that you know titrating for effect, like what you would be able to do with with ketamine um, is probably not safe uh, in that right. environment. I think it, there, are, there are a lot of studies that show uh, it is opioid sparing, it, uh, and this is in like uh, the surgical patient population, right? right. It's opioid sparing, it, um, patients have uh, improved post-operative pain, they ambulate uh, more quickly after surgery, they have returnal bowel function more quickly after surgery. And, um, for those reasons, uh, it's used, you know, frequently in the perioperative environment. I think it would be a difficult drug to use in most prolonged field care settings, just because of that, that, um, narrow margin between when it's therapeutic for pain and where it becomes toxic. Now, but at least the the one study and the one podcast that I listened to about using it, you know, they weren't talking about using it as a sole agent either. So I guess how big is the bang, I guess, for using IV lidocaine and taking that chance with the toxicity? I would say in this case, probably not that great. Mm -hmm. um, I just think the the risk of using it is probably not worth the reward because when we give it an, at induction of anesthesia, uh, we usually give one, um, one milligram per kilogram. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, for a hundred kilogram patient, that is, you know, a hundred milligrams. So you give a hundred milligrams, even with that, you're not looking for a pain at, or, or an opioid sparing effect. What it does is it decreases the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy. Um, and what you hope for is that the patient doesn't become, uh, you know, hypertensive when you right. uh, place okay. the the, um, the laryngoscope the blade. Yeah, it, oh, yeah pl you place the laryngoscope uh, blade or pass the tube. Mm -hmm. So it's not we're not really looking for pain. And I think um, almost all the studies that they're doing, they do give a bolus of lidocaine, but that is just so that you're um, your infusion and your concentration, you could, you'll have a more therapeutic uh, level of lidocaine more quickly. Okay. And that, so I, I don't know that it would be that much of a benefit, like I said, in the prolonged field care setting, just because it's probably a little bit too difficult to administer. And the, the, the risk of it, in my opinion, would probably be, um, higher than what the reward is right well not to mention you know the reversal for it we do not have you know the lipid emulsion right and that's the other thing and it that goes along with what i said before whatever 
intervention you're planning on doing, you have to have a contingency to get yourself out of it. I think it's important for people to know that like, if you're going to be doing a procedure or an intervention, know how to get yourself out of it. And if you don't have the lipid emulsion, which uh, I'm guessing almost nobody is care. I don't know what's in the tax sets these days, <laughs> Not that, uh, but I'm guessing that they don't have uh, local anesthetics, uh, you know, systemic toxic toxicity um, kit. Right. Nope, we don't got it. Um, but uh, no, I've definitely, I've heard it frequently as like, uh, as, Hey, this is probably a good idea. Good thing to do. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking like, well, if you're worried about, you know, opioid sparing effects, well, why don't you use Tylenol instead or, or something else, um, versus IV lidocaine, but. Right. I, I think it's a good idea. I think it's just the wrong environment. I think once you get to, I, once you get to, you know, somewhere where you have personnel that can monitor that. And that that's the biggest thing is when we put somebody on a lidocaine infusion, they bought themselves monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. This is a very closely monitored medication because we understand that the therapeutic index is so small with this medication. Um, so, you know, it. I, I think in most hospitals now, at least the literature that I've read, it can only be administered by the pain service or uh, an anesthesia team. Um, and I don't know what it's like elsewhere. I, I can only speak from, I think, how they're still doing it our, at our institution. We run it in the operating room very frequently. Um, and I, like I said, I think it's a great adjunct, but I think it just probably requires a little bit more monitoring the capability than what you'd have in uh, most tactical and prolonged care, uh, excuse me, prolonged field care setting. Outstanding. Well, uh, well, thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Oh, of course, Dennis. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Anytime. Outstanding. Well, I'll keep your, your number for certain because I have lots of questions. For sure. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you. Thank you.